Ayn Rand has long been one of the idols for a lot of like ANCAPs and libertarians and still is to this day. I mean, Prager, you made a video on them right now. Ayn Rand herself and her work uh, is not what a lot of people think it is. Um, a lot of people think that she's like an economist or like a, you know, like a strong academic of some kind. She's neither, but she was a novelist and her works garner a lot of attention. But instead of me poisoning the well with my crazy lefty conspiracy theories about Ayn Rand, I'm going to present to you one of the best accounts that you can ever receive of any political issue or person or historical event that you can imagine. Prager University, we can always rely on them for good fact-based research and information. Understanding Ayn Rand, I'm ready. I'm ready to understand. Prager you, show me. Who is John Galt? This is, is one of the most famous questions in modern literature. Even today, over 50 years after it was written, you'll hear people asking it. Why? Because it recalls the riveting suspense story, heroic characters, and powerful ideas portrayed in the best-selling novel Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Born in St. Petersburg, Russia on February 2, 1905, Rand became one of the most celebrated authors and philosophers of the 20th century. Her most famous novels, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, still sell hundreds of thousands of copies every year I'm sure she around was a good the author. world. I don't know anything about Rand her author, lived but, through the yeah. early years of the Russian Revolution, saw her father's pharmacy business confiscated by the Bolsheviks, and experienced the horrors of communism firsthand. She okay. longed to emigrate we can to America. Talk about a few things there. Quick statement makes in pre pretty much every preview video, but I'm going to debunk it anyway. USSR. Not communist. X. No, not communist. Communism, as defined by Karl Marx, is a classless, moneyless, and stateless society. The Soviet Union, especially 1917, was none of those three things. You could make some slim argument that it may have been an authoritarian bend on a socialist revolution. That's one way that's authoritarian socialism. You could make that argument. However, when it comes to my personal brand of socialism, my personal one, I'm the only one who has this brand. I invented it, one could say, of libertarian socialism. State power is not necessary. State seizure of these industries for the ownership of the state, rather for the ownership of the workers, is not inherent to socialism and is certainly not communism by any means. In 1926, she did and never looked back. To Rand, the United States meant freedom. She saw the Founding Fathers as heroes. They created a country based on individual rights, man's right to his own life, to his own liberty, to the pursuit of his own happiness. Wow, gender. I guess only men are allowed to do this. Damn. I guess they're just doing everything to avoid using they as a personal pronoun. Means that every individual has a right to exist for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others, nor sacrificing others to himself, nor to the government. Hold on. Self to others, nor sacrificing others to himself. Nor sacrificing others to herself, or himself, or themselves, or whoever selves. I don't know what version of America this is. This sounds like a pretty interesting version of America, but a main staple of American culture and just American life in general is literally the sort of like business sharks, Wall Street wolf, stepping on other people to make your own way, American dream kind of mentality. So both from like a more like cultural or like esoteric perspective on America, this is true. Now, when it comes to how America looks like today, we see the massive growing wealth disparities between the average people in society and the, you know, like massive like business owners, the richest people in the United States of America. And oh my, what do they do except for like step on their workers and extract their surplus labor? A society, you know, under my system, uh, under a cooperatively run economy, uh, then this would remain true, right? Because you wouldn't be stepping on people, you would be working with them to achieve your own goals. In capitalism, People are often forced to compete against each other. And the only time they do not do that when it's in, you know, when it's in the short term, like direct interest of the other person. But once you've accumulated enough capital, enough power, enough influence, then you can afford to be really ruthless in the way you run your businesses and the way you conduct or the way you run your, your economic business. The practical results of the American system, Rand said, could be seen in the skyline of New York City. America's skyscrapers, she noted, 
were not built by public funds nor for a public purpose. They were built by the energy, initiative, and wealth of private individuals for personal profit. And instead of impoverishing the people, these skyscrapers, as they rose higher and higher, kept raising the people's standard of living. Also, standard of living in the U.S. right now is literally falling <laughs> under capitalism. I think the new coming generation is the only generation that will have it worse than the previous generation. When you talk about standard of living, maybe in, in certain aspects, yes, standard of living has gone up. How much of that is attributable directly to capitalism? Very debatable. How much of that is contributed to technological and medicinal developments? Probably a lot of it. On top of that, a system which literally, you know, is contributing to a massive overarching social and economic problem, which is climate change. I don't know how you want to factor that into the standard of living argument, but it probably belongs somewhere in there. On top of that, you know what? Maybe they have discovered a new way of political analysis here on PragerU. Maybe we should assess political systems based on how tall the buildings are. It's, it's an interesting maneuver. It's true. Then I guess maybe Sweden would be screwed. Malmö has a, has a pretty high building. Maybe Malmö has a good economic system. The rest of Sweden kind of meh economic system. That's a possibility. Maybe we should do that. Rand advocated pure capitalism, which she described as a system in which the government acts only as a policeman that protects men's rights. No bailouts, no special favors for big business, no government intervention into the economy. So they posture this as if this would be worse for small business and better for bigger business. I can guarantee you that a lot of the large regulations, certain smaller regulations definitely may hurt smaller businesses. And I believe it's a job of the government to be able to compensate for that. But a lot of the major business, such as uh, the major regulations, such as like the antitrust laws, the removal of those would massively be like benefit big businesses. This is basically what's called minarchism, I believe, where the only thing that governments are responsible for is just, you know, like being a policeman. Um, number one, that, that would be a pretty, pretty garbage society <laughs> because a lot of things that are profitable to like handle or to run would be very difficult. I mean, you know, who builds the roads? That's a pretty classic one. On top of that, a lot of the property laws or a lot of the general regulations that are put in place by government, uh, we would see some pretty weird practices of certain pieces of land being owned by business owners or by people on that land. And then having that make the, you know, like transport around the region very ineffective, or just basically maybe just encircling <laughs> an individual with their own land and being like, okay, what are you gonna do now? But you know, because it's not gonna be publicly owned land, everything's gonna be privately run. When it comes to more of the economic prescriptions of Ayn Rand, we can look at a bit of her, uh, her history here. Look at the Wikipedia page. That's always the best source of information. Okay. Ayn Rand does not have any, you know, qualifications within economics at all. She's not an economist by any means. She is, you know, debatably a philosopher. Uh, yeah, she learned social pedagogy, majoring in history. So she didn't even major in philosophy. Uh, she learned about the writings of Aristotle and Plato, who were greatest influence and counter influence. Um, she studied philosophical works, able to read a bunch of languages. She discovered a bunch of writers who became her favorite. Uh, but she was purged from university by the Communist Party, which is cringe. Don't purge people from university. That's awful. Before she could graduate. So while it may not have been a fault that she didn't graduate, even if she had, it wouldn't have been in economics. But, uh, it, it still speaks to say about her like economic prescriptions. I'm sure she was a wonderful novelist. Maybe. I'm not sure I haven't read any of your work. Um, but when it comes to her economic prescriptions, she doesn't really have much backing to that. Uh, on top of it, there's a pretty humorous bit here at the very end. Rand underwent surgery for lung cancer in 1974 after decades of heavy smoking. In 1976, she retired from writing her newsletter, and after her initial objections, she allowed social worker Eva Pryor, an employee of her attorney, to enroll her in Social Security and Medicare, baby. Woo! How's that free market capitalism working out? When people are free to produce and trade, and when the government is limited to protecting rights, everyone benefits. Individuals thrive. Societies prosper. How do we know this? Compare know this. freer, more capitalist societies to less free, more statist ones. In Rand's day, America compared to the Soviet Union. Western. Okay. If you're comparing just statist and capitalist, that's fine. This is a weird dichotomy, though. You can still have like a status version of capitalism, like how much regulation you want to have on something. Capitalism fundamentally has to do with the, what's it called? Um, the ownership of the means of production, which are run privately. That would be capitalism then. Typically operating within a market society as well. I think that's a pretty, pretty fair thing to allocate to capitalism there. On top of that, these examples are like pretty cherry picked as well. When you come about just statism and capitalism 
on its own. You know, a lot of it has to do with the effectiveness of capitalism and status societies. So, for example, uh, Sweden is a lot more, or like Europe as a whole, is a lot more statist than the United States is, and the United States is a lot more capitalist than what Europe is. However, I could make a bunch of arguments in that, you know, to demonstrate that Europe is doing a lot better socioeconomically than what the United States is doing. Uh, and these cherry-picked examples don't really work to like prove a point in the way that she thinks they do. Germany to East Germany, more recently, South Korea to North Korea, Colombia to Venezuela. Such differences were painfully obvious to Rand. So were their causes. In Atlas Shrugged, she showed how easily a free society can collapse into a dictatorship. The heroine, Dagny Taggart, works tirelessly and brilliantly to save her family's railroad business, while ever-increasing government interventions destroy businesses and crush Once the again, economy. Once again, a novel, by the Meanwhile, way. Meanwhile, one by one, the top producers across various industries mysteriously disappear. No one knows where they have gone. The only clue is a question they leave behind. Who is John Galt? As the economy crumbles, how do politicians, bureaucrats, and academics react? They blame the greedy businessman and decry the profit motive and free markets. Their solution? More government intervention, which of course only makes the problem worse. Sound familiar? Having government interventions in times of economic downturns is actually one of the most crucial things that you need. That's what Roosevelt did after the Great Depression. He had a massive, like an unprecedented level of government intervention into the economy, and that's what was able to turn the economy around. During times of economic crisis and economic downturns, the state can step in and ensure that they don't, you know, keep, doesn't keep going down and that things end up improving. So it's it, it's very important when it comes to uh, when it comes to like the role of the government when it comes to the economy. It's not just like government bad for economy, government good for economy. There are certain policies by governments which go against market forces, which tend to be less effective. There are some which increases or decreases externalities, which you might want to increase or decrease, positive and negative ones respectively. This whole like dichotomizing or essentializing just like government action as like a wholesale negative or positive for an economy is extraordinarily silly when it comes to like having nuanced understandings on how an economy works. But once again, Ayn Rand is not an economist. I wouldn't expect her to, um, to have like this, what's it called, understanding of an economy. Atlas Shrugged is a cautionary tale about pursuing equality over excellence, state control over free markets, but it's also about the power of the individual and the power of reason. The individual's reason in mind, Rand argued, what? is his tool of knowledge, his only means of understanding what is true or false, how the world works, what is good or bad for his life. That's true. Everything except for socialism, your brain just turns off, okay? It's true. People actually say this. Uh, it was actually under capitalism that people invented the brain. Before capitalism, brains didn't exist. It's pretty crazy. Uh, capitalism actually invented brains and then sold them for cheap prices in a competitive market towards human beings. And therefore, we're able to think about all the cool things we're able to today. It's pretty cool, actually. I like Pregary for bringing up this point. It's very interesting. This is the theme of Rand's work more broadly. In order to thrive, to achieve happiness, the individual must think for himself and live by the judgment of his own mind. To do this, people must be free free to voluntarily exchange ideas, goods, and services for mutual benefit. I agree with this, okay? Competitiveness within a market, having a well-informed market, is good for economic outcomes. 100%. This is not something that I need to, like, argue against, because it's true. Now, putting freedom as a dichotomy against for example, like regulation and government action is an absolutely garbage and worthless dichotomy that tells us nothing. It's just ideological fodder at that point. So for example, I ask you this, do you think that you're more or less free in society because of traffic laws? I would argue that it makes me a lot more free because I'm able to get out and walk around the street without having to worry about getting run over. You could make this argument if, if you really wanted to, if you want to be logically consistent here and be like, hey, no, traffic laws, they need to go, okay? I'm sick of the government restricting where I can drive my vehicle. Which was made with a lot of like publicly funded research and inventions that build the car in general. But let's not talk about that. 
I can't believe the government is restricting my action to drive my car and my ability to do so wherever I want. This is authoritarian. This is reducing my ability to voluntarily exchange goods and, you know, like to voluntarily do whatever I want here. Putting government action and intervention and regulation as a dichotomy against freedom is really dumb because there's a lot of government action that can increase personal freedom. I would say when it comes to voluntary exchange, or when it comes to keeping competitive markets, me, as well as many other, even capitalist and liberal thinkers, such as, um, I think it was Adam Smith, mentioned, for example, that a true free market requires regulations on the ability for businesses to form oligopolies and monopolies. Because fundamentally, in the long term, in a free market, uh, what ends up happening is that one business wins. You can talk about the legitimacy of that, but wins the market. At that point, they gain an unjust amount of power and influence. And those sort of like formations where you have a massive amount of market share and a lot of disproportionate influence is called either a monopoly, if you're pretty much the only one uh, that has that, or an oligopoly, if it's split between like two or three or four, like pretty big businesses. In order to retain competitiveness, we should seek to minimize the prevalence of monopolies and oligopolies. And that's something that government action, antitrust laws, uh, positive policies towards smaller businesses, regulatory policies towards big businesses to, for example, ensure that they are held to a higher standard than smaller businesses or stuff like that can all serve to make the economies, to make the economies and the markets more competitive. I would argue that yes, competitiveness is important. I agree with this. And in order to retain those competitive markets, you need some level of state action. Otherwise, you end up with monopolies and oligopolies, which just get rid of basically all of the benefits that comes with competitiveness free to speak their minds without fear. For this, she regarded capitalism not only as the best, but as the only moral social system. Cap also, voluntary is a bit of a, of a weird word. It's a bit of a loaded way to say it. Free exchange would probably be better. In an economy, there are like a bunch of pressures, positives and negatives on a person to make certain decisions on some people being given advantages on the basis of like just who they were born into, like stuff like this, where they have literally no influence over that makes this voluntary exchange uh, more like one sided than one might appear. And once again, government action can balance out the different parties within an exchange and make sure that the actions are beneficial to all and are more voluntary. Capitalism does not tell men to suffer. Ah, yes. Socialism tells men to suffer. That's what socialism is. Socialism is when men are told to suffer and they haven't mentioned women. So I guess women, they're cool. They can just prosper Men suffer though. And there are no brains because brains are invented under capitalism. Got it. Okay. We're all on the same page. Good to go. But to pursue enjoyment and achievement, she argued, capitalism does not preach passivity, humility, resignation, but independence self-confidence self-reliance <laughs> what does this even mean <laughs> what these are just you can do this with like literally any system ever just like assign these 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 words to it and i can also argue with how um how capitalism without like government intervention has is a detrimental effect to all of these things and also a lot of these things aren't even like debatably like a uniform good, like self-reliance, only relying on yourself or being able to rely on yourself, depending on how they would define it, I suppose, is something that I don't know if that's like a uniform good always. Like, I don't know. This is just like, like a meaningless platitude. Above all, Rand emphasized, capitalism does not permit anyone to expect or demand the unearned. Is this the system America lives under now? No, said Rand. She called capitalism the unknown ideal because it has never been fully implemented. It these are the same people, I swear to God. These are literally the same people that make fun of you like, oh, that wasn't real socialism, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm sure. I'm sure if you did, it would be real socialism. And then they pulled this shit. <laughs> capitalism has never been fully implemented. It's not, it's an unknown ideal. It's, it's, it's crony capitalism or whatever. It's, it's incredibly funny. This full capitalism that they're talking about, a minarchist society, even though I don't like the United States, would be a million times worse in the United States than it exists today, okay? It, this is just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good meme. Even in America, Ayn Rand's ideas on capitalism, individualism, and reason have attracted millions of people to her novels, essays, and lectures, and still do. Who is John Galt? I'm Gloria Alvarez with the Objective Standard Institute for Prager University. This video was made possible by a generous donation so every from the Objective Prager U Standard video. Institute. Every single PragerU video has had these, like, these institutions. Let's see. Objective Standard Institute. Okay. <laughs> it's literally an organization based on Ayn Rand's ideals.
yes, let's trust them to uh, to accurately and you know non-partisanly represent the uh, the life and the beliefs of Ayn Rand in a video. Nice of me. Okay.